Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on The Dairy Signal. In a moment, we're going to dive into the five traits of a great team. But before we do that with our guest here this afternoon, let's jump back to 19 France, where we are going to be diving into a cave. So it was on this day that a collection of prehistoric cave paintings were discovered by four French teenagers who stumbled, stumbled upon the ancient artwork when they were following a dog down a narrow entrance of a cavern. Um, the pieces of art ended up being 15,000 to 17,000 years old, according to archaeologists, and they consistent and they are consisting mostly of animal representations, and they are some of the best examples of art from from the Upper Paleolithic period. Um, it was the walls of this cavern had over 600 painted and drawn animal symbols and nearly 1,500 engravings. Um, the pictures depicted many different types of animals, including those of mythological beings. And fun fact, there was only one human figure represented in the drawings. Archaeologists believe that the cave was used over a long period of time as a center for hunting and religious sites, and they interpret these and other discoveries of Ice Age rock art as evidence of the new emergence that directly um, was with the human consciousness. So interesting uh, interpretations of their art that were some of the best ones that they have known. And fun fact about this cave, it was actually open to the public for viewing until the 1960s, and then they decommissioned that option just because of the artificial light that was actually taking away some of that vibrant color that stayed due to being in the dark for so long. Um, but today we're not here to talk all about archaeology and cave paintings, as much fun as that may be for some of us. Today we're here to talk about the five great traits of a team. So with us this afternoon, we are joined by Tim Schaefer, who is a certified family business advisor and certified business um, professional business coach with Encore Consultants. So thank you for being back with us and joining us once again, Tim. I know we're going to dive into a lot of really great information and resources for people here this afternoon. But if this is their first time meeting you, would you mind just giving people a little bit of an introduction about yourself? Sure thing. Uh, so I live in West Central Minnesota and uh, grew up on a farm and uh, and really for um, you know my career spans about uh, 28 years now but uh, but really started focusing in the last 10 years on uh, family business tra uh, transition planning uh, and which then led it led into executive co coaching and, and development really to bring in that that next generation and, and help them be successful because dairy is getting, you know, scaling up. Farms in general are scaling up, and we just need people. and And it's just different. It's it's more it's more more and more. We're seeing the success being defined, um, and the differentiation is uh, is due to uh, is due to leadership and and how things are managed more so than uh, than commodities and maybe commodity prices. So yeah, it's all good well, stuff. I work, for, I work. Yeah, I work from coast to coast and into Canada as well. So. Well, as I mentioned, we're glad you're here today to dive into this topic, especially as you mentioned, farms have drastically changed in the last 5, 10, 15 years. And everything with that change encompasses also family change, business change, and so much more. So we'll dive into all of that today. I do want to remind those who are watching live, though, that we are also uh, having the opportunity to have this program, today's episode of The Dairy Signal, be accredited through Dairy Advance, also known as DACE. So if you're looking to get that half credit of DACE Continuing Education Unit, make sure to tune in throughout today's episode. And then at the very end, um, at the bottom of your, your viewing screen, you can press the little button that says quiz, and you can take the short, brief quiz that'll help you get your half credits of DACE CEUs. So make sure to take advantage of that opportunity and show those who uh, may be wondering that you're continuing your education in many and a variety of different ways through the Dairy Signal. I also want to mention that if you have questions for today's episode, make Make sure to get them in while you're watching live. We'll be taking them throughout the episode. So Tim, uh, we'll see what comes through and what good questions are brought on by the viewers today. We always love when people participate. So make sure to, to join in if you are watching live with that. But for now, I'm going to throw it back to you, Tim, to get us started on the information here this afternoon. Hey, great. Uh, yeah, Amber, I'm really glad to be back. And uh, we, we I, I always enjoy these so much. So 
Um, but today, yeah, we're going to talk about the, the traits of great teams. And, um, you know, even with even with robotics, even with all the change, it there is so much about people. And and the um, and, and I think a lot of times we look at we look at uh, a team and we use that term very generically. And I put this quote up because it is, I, I swear, the most generic quote out there or definition out there, but it really doesn't capture the essence of what a team is. Um, so often we use that word team, but I feel like maybe we use it incorrectly because we say, well, if we have a collection of people, then that's a team. Um, or, or, you know, if, if we're all in the same room, then we're a team, or if we're all working on the same farm, we're a team. No, at that point, I, I would challenge that, that, that instead you are a collection of people. It takes, it takes more work, uh, to build a team. Because really teams, great teams, they're built. They're built just like you build your dairy. Uh, they just don't happen. It, you know, great teams are built intentionally with very intentional uh, results that you're looking for. Um, what we're going to cover today is uh, is really some work that a gentleman by the name of Patrick Lecioni did. And, and uh, he did the research came back and wrote the book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. But we're going to spin that into uh, how do we apply that here uh, on a dairy farm and, and really how do, you, how do you build up that team. Um, the interesting thing that, to keep in mind as we go through today is that each one of these traits, each one of these skills, they build on another. So we're going to start at the bottom and work our way to the top realizing that we cannot skip a step. And, and that would be my encouragement to each one of you is don't skip a step as you uh, start your journey on, on maybe building up, up your team. Um, really for well over 10 years now, uh, close to, um, almost 20 years, US and Canada have been able to observe and work with some fantastic operations and no farm is perfect. Everyone has their flaws. Every, every leader has their flaws. They have their weak points and everything else. But it, it, it's the traits and it's the work that they put in on a consistent basis that over time really helps build a great team that a lot of people want to come uh, be a part of. So, and, and when we use the word teams today, let's not just think of our employees, right? It also involves family members and probably even more importantly, we need to pay attention to some of these concepts as it pertains to family. So I think we can all look at what an unhealthy team is, and, and maybe we don't have that perfect definition, but we know, we kind of know it when we see it, don't we? There's a lot of, there's a lot of drama. There's a lot of gridlock. Decisions aren't made. Um, you, you know, uh, you come onto the farm, you ask a question and every small, every small thing has to be brought before all the other owners or employees aren't empowered to make decisions. Um, you know, there's bad behavior that just, that just slides, but they put up with it because they're too afraid to actually deal, deal with the issue. Uh, and ultimately, I think that the, what happens with an un, unhealthy team is that people don't want to be part of it. Family do doesn't want to be part of it. And really, people that might be looking at, at the dairy farm, they're going to look at that and say, I really, I want to be part of a winning team. I don't really want to be part of an unhealthy team. So, so this, this, this affects the bottom line as well. All right, so let's, let's jump into this. Um, the first trait that every team needs is trust. Now, you say, well... I'm trustworthy, right? I don't lie. I don't cheat. You know, I, I don't cheat my employees on their paycheck. You know, uh, that that great. And uh, and very few people are are truly dishonest. And yet, let me just tell you a story of a guy named Mark, a uh, young guy, really, really wanted to prove himself on 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 his farm. And so, you know, Mark is a guy that just just bulls ahead. He never asks for any help. He's never wrong. Um, he's never met Mark has never made, made a mistake in his life. And I think we know these, this type of person, right? Mark is also not opening to hearing other purple people's experiences or perspectives. Uh, he's got this real bravado, tough guy image. 
And, and what happens is, is the rest of his employees and his, and his family members, they're all kind of like, they all kind of stay back from Mark. Mark's a, Mark's a really a good guy. He's really a sharp guy. But at this point, people don't, they're, they're nervous being around him because he's, he does so many small things that, that tear down the trust versus, versus, uh, versus build it up. So uh, let's look at a couple pitfalls of, uh, of low trust. Um, you know, it, it's like Mark doesn't ask for help, creates a communication triangle. I want to talk a little bit about that. So when we're not in a symptom, and this is especially true with families, if there's a disagreement between father and son or between two siblings and such like that, one thing to really watch out for is, are we creating a triangle? Do we go tell mom? Right. Do we go tell mom that we're having trouble with our dad or with our sister uh, or working on the farm together and drag mom into this? Or are we able to to just deal with it directly? So they, these are some of the symptoms or signs that maybe trust isn't as high as, as what it could be. Um, you know, people are afraid of things blowing up. And so they just there are certain topics that never get discussed. Right. Taboo topics. Or another one is you have a, maybe you have a family meeting and then there's kind of like all these side conversations. All these things are really, they're really signs that maybe trust isn't as high as what it could be. Amber, feel free, by the way, anytime just to jump in and, uh, and ask any questions if anything kind of jumps to your mind. Well, once you go through this one, when you talk about the cure, I do have a question I want to ask, but I feel okay. like we go through this before I jump in on that one. Perfect. Perfect. So what, what is the cure? You know, honest and infrequent mistakes, they are okay. They're absolutely okay. Nobody is perfect. Uh, when people make mistakes, at least at least the first time, maybe the second time, it's, it's a learning experience. Treat it as that uh, mentor and coach. More than likely, you have good people that are just trying their very hardest. Um, it's okay. It's okay to ask for help. And it, it, my encouragement, especially is for people just joining the dairy, uh, may, maybe in a leadership role, it's okay to ask for help. It is okay to admit that you don't have all the answers and maybe, maybe talk to that. Some of those senior employees that have been there a long time. Um, it, it's perfectly okay. They, they will, they will respect that versus look down. Um, you know what, when, when, when a relationship go, goes south, just apologize, just apologize and say you're sorry. So many relationships can be instantly repaired by, by owning, owning the air and apologizing for it. So it's, uh, trust is, trust is one of those things that is, it never stays in one spot. It's always moving and it, and you always have to be doing things that build trust because just over time, trust itself will will start to uh, will start to fade away. So, Amber, what, what what was the question? You know, when we're talking about all of this and like building a team, and especially when it comes to trust, I think about like the hierarchy within a farm, and it makes me think: whose responsibility is this? Who should be the one who goes? You know what? This, this is something we need to work on. Is it an individual who is trying to better the team as a group? Or is it, I'm thinking like a manager or something like that, business owner, the HR person, whomever. Or is it something that has to be discussed and thought of as everybody needs to have a certain level of trust in order for this to succeed? What exactly does that look like in the dynamic of a team as you're thinking about this and as you're getting started on trying to, A, start building trust before you move to the next levels? Yeah, so um, everything we're going to talk about today starts from the top down. So so as, um, so as, uh, as leaders, as owners, however you want to define it, it's got to start, it's got to start from the top and and then and then go down. If you try to do it from the bottom up, what happens is uh, it builds cynicism within the team because uh, the employees will say, "Well, wait a minute, um, you know." Well, let me give you an example of a really small thing. Um, it's it's just a small thing that 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 degrades trust. Uh, one is being on time, right? And we expect our our employees at a punch and clock. We expect them to be on time. They they can't be late for their shift. But how often as owners do we make excuses for ourselves for being late? And so we'll call an employee 
a meeting, but then the owners will be late, right? And, and so if we expect things, this uh, building trust goes, you walk the walk and it's got to start from the top. And, and being time, being on time is just one of those, just an example um, that that it's got to come from the top down. And, 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 um, and it's about building culture as well, but that's that's kind of a whole whole nother topic. Did that answer the question or is, or is there is there more to it? I think that did. Um, but we did have a question that just came in seconds ago that kind of spins off of this, especially on the trust side. And it reads, yeah. how do you know if you are successfully building trust? And I think that's a good question to ask yourself, especially, you know, as we're thinking about this as a, a triangle and you want that base level first as you're building on, how do you know you've, you've done it right? So the, the quick the, 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 the quick answer is that there's, a, there's actually an assessment that, um, that you can download and actually send this through your entire organization and ask all, and it's a certain 30 some questions that, that, that can see exactly where, where you're strong and where you're weak at, on this, on this uh, triangle. That's one. Um, another is, is, um, you know, sometimes as owners, as managers, we don't get challenged and, and your employees will not offer suggestions on how to improve things. And they won't challenge you and some of your ideas if they don't feel safe. If if they if they don't if they don't feel like they can say something and it won't blow back on them, uh, they won't say it. And so if you're getting good feedback and, and 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 things like that, not tattletale, but you're getting good feedback from your employees, that is a really good sign, a really good sign where, where they'll well they'll challenge they'll they'll respectfully challenge the owners. Yeah. Okay. And then I have one more question off of this before we move on, because yeah. I think of the, the family dynamic that comes in with trust. And oftentimes in a very business structured setting, you hire somebody, they come in and you may or may not have had um, experiences with them prior. So you, you might come in with a clean slate with them, whereas family, family is okay. a little bit more sticky. Um, oh. You know that there is a lot that goes into prior to working together. Uh, so how do you work on that trust in a business setting with family without taking in um, anything that may have previously happened outside of the business structure? All right. New employee, new relationship. You know, what, what can you do? Um, one of the first things, first things that you do is, is be clear about your expectations so that, so that everyone knows what you expect from, from them as an employee so that they know how they're going to be judged. So it doesn't seem like, I don't know if I'm doing a good job or it appeared like I was doing a good job. Now he's upset at me, right? Have very clear expectations up front. Um, also do everything you can to build up their competency. When you help somebody else build their competency and you yourself are competent leaders uh, yourself, that builds trust because, because we all like to be around competent people. Um, also show that that you are committed to them and helping them do their job well. Um, you know, and, and it's about making sure that you don't just treat them like a tool, that you that you build a connection with them as a person. Um, so because when when you do that, then they're going to ask for help. You want to make it. We do not want any of our employees to go out there and start messing up and then not or feel unsure and not and not feel safe enough to be able to ask for help. Uh, and then finally, I think one of the things is just be consistent. You know, as an owner and leader, unfortunately, we're not allowed to have bad days. We're not allowed to be a grouchy person one day and happy the next, right? We, we just have to be consistent in how we deal with each other, how we deal with situations, how we deal with our emotions. So th those are just a couple. Okay, thank you. I'll let you continue on. We have another question that came in, but I think it'll be good in this next section as well. Perfect, perfect. So once you build trust, right? We talked about the importance of you build up that trust and now people feel like they can speak up with not having things blow back at them because mastering conflict is really about solving problems. Like we, we don't enter into conflict because we like it. A lot of times, we, you know, from young ages, we were taught that conflict is bad, right? Quit fighting. Uh, you know, we get sent to our room or whatever. Um, 
But if there's trust there, then you can enter, then it's safe to enter into, into have, having conflict with a purpose. So the conflict is to solve the problem and, and get, it, um, get it taken care of. And I think we all have these friends. Uh, I know I do. His, his name is Dave. And, and Dave, I don't care how, what the issue is. Dave can tell me anything because I trust his motives. He's a person with no guile. And I know that he truly cares for me. And so Dave and I can have some really tough conversations uh, because we have the trust. All right. So that, let's look at a little bit of unhealthy conflict. Um, probably the biggest ones, um, biggest signs is when there's decisions that's based on politics. In other words, um, hey, we're going to put the dairy or we're going to put the farm shop here because it's closer to somebody's somebody's house and they yelled the loudest in the meeting and so that's where it's going to go right so so you're making you're making political decisions versus business decisions um there's let me give you another one and and this happens a lot in, in when we're working in family family farms people disengage from the conflict in other words they will not enter into it so i i, I think back about 10 years ago maybe 12 uh, family that are coming in for some transition planning and the junior partner, he was going to be a partner. He got really quiet in the meetings and then he started checking his phone and then he started replying to his texts and then he, oh, I got to take this phone call. And then the phone calls got longer and then he quit coming to the meetings whatsoever. Right. So when people are disengaging, when they're not entering into, into conflict, that is a sign. That is a sign that there that there is something uh, something really uh, really wrong that that really needs to be addressed and, and fixed before before you can actually solve any issues. So, so Tim, I think this is where I want to ask the question yeah. um, that was brought up a little bit ago. It was more on the trust side because we were talking about in order to be successful at having trust and in order to, you know, um, have a good, you know, conflict resolution, you have to have people be able to speak their mind without fear of retaliation. So this yep. is where this question is coming from. And it reads, what's the best way to get candid feedback that's not muted by the fear of retaliation? Okay. Do you know, Amber, is this uh, is this from an employee or is this within family? Any I do idea? not know. It wasn't specified. But if they are listening, they can feel free to type in more. It, it, it really it really depends on at, at what level uh, at what level this this is happening. So let me let me run with the with the assumption that it's that it's uh, employer employee. Um. First of all, you have to you have to let people know that you want it, and, and 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 it's not like, hey, what's on your mind? It's it's about creating that culture of really candid feedback, and 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 asking for it. So uh, asking for disagreement. So like when you have an employee meeting, and, and and you just say, hey, does anybody see it differently than what I've just shared? And, 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 and you're going to get silence that first time. You're going to get silence the second time, the third time. But after a while, it's going to be like, I think this guy's serious about asking for feedback. So you ask for feedback every, you know, just about every step of the way. Uh, hey, do you see it different? Do you see the issue the same that I'm seeing it? Things like that. Um, having that radical candor, it, it takes time. But after a while, they'll, they'll, it'll, it'll start to gel. That yeah, they're serious about about what I care, what I'm what I think. They're serious about learning what I what I think. There you go. Okay, I think that helps. Um, they haven't written in anything else, so I'm going to assume okay. that that's the situation. Sure. Um, but yes, I'll let you continue on because I know there's more unhealthy conflict to talk about and the oh, yeah. love uh, ways to solve that. Yeah, yeah, and and another just just one last one, especially when we see transition plans that get stuck, and people get into that. Well, let me think about it mode. Wow, that that's that's a sign that that's a sign that there's some fear of conflict, or people aren't comfortable having having um, having conflict. So, um, the cure. That, let's talk about the cure for 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 dealing with conflict. I think I think the first thing you do is is especially in leadership meetings, once again, it starts at the top, 
getting it on the agenda. Hey, we're going to talk about conflict and making making it very explicit that and and having a discussion uh, around conflict and just saying, let's talk about conflict. Are we comfortable with it? What don't we like about it? Uh, hey, we did, you know, we, we, we did the five dysfunctions of a team survey and we, we figured out that we're not that strong in conflict. What do you, why, you know, having those discussions, just realize that the good conflict is good. Um, another, another thing is, is so often we want to pin the conflict on the person and, and, and instead of attacking the problem jointly, we attack the person, um, and very rarely does that work. Um, and, and another another good habit to get into is having consistent meetings where people don't let stuff just boil over at the wrong time, right? So that there's a time and a place for this meeting. And I one of my favorite tools, one of my favorite tools is creating an issues list. And this can be a piece of paper in somebody's office. This can be Hey, here it goes on a on a WhatsApp group uh, within the owner say, but but where anyone, if they have an issue, if they have a gripe, if they have something that needs fixed, or they need they need a problem solved jointly as a leadership group or as an employee group, it gets put on that list. That way, people get it out of their mind, off their heart, and they know that at that next meeting, which is of course consistent, and you have them frequently. That uh, that you're going to actually talk about it and you're going to get it resolved, um, so that people aren't walking around with all this all this stuff, you know, just waiting to boil over. Um, yeah, so the issues list, I I'm big fan of those. They they really work well. I'll let you continue on here. We had another question come through, but I'm yeah. thinking we will hold on to this one just for another moment. Yep. Yep. So I love this quote, deal with the emotional issues before the emotions become the issue. And if we let conflict go so long without getting into that healthy problem solving mode, because that's what we need to have. We can't just have conflict. We got to We got to solve the problem together and move on. After a while, you know, people say, well, you know, we're not going to deal with it. They're not going to deal with it. After a while, the only thing that's left is raw emotion. And, and then it becomes very, very difficult to, uh, to unwind. And um, yeah, we, and I think, I think a lot of times we avoid conflict for the right reasons. We don't want to hurt other people's feelings. We don't, you know, we're, we're maybe afraid of the blowback or we're just respectful. We are, we are respectful. We're like, I don't want to challenge the senior generation on something. You know, uh, that's not respecting our elders, that sort of thing. So all right, so now we've built up that trust. We're starting to master conflict. We're actually able to solve some problems. And when we solve problems, now the next thing is, is we need to be building commitment towards maybe what direction we're gonna go, where, where we're going to invest our time and talent and money. Um, you know, we're starting to come together for a joint vision. And the thing is about commitment. We always say, well, we want our employees to be committed. We want our family members to be committed. And one of the best ways, well, let me back up. People will not be committed just be, to some sort of a plan just because you tell them. That doesn't build commitment. Um, they become committed to a plan when there's trust, when there is good conflict, but also when they are part of the process. So, so if you want people to be committed to, to some sort of plan or some sort of vision or some sort of direction, you need to ask their opinion and get their buy-in. And when you ask people's opinion, even if a lot of times, even if they don't quote, get their way, they're much, uh, they appreciate being part, being part of the process and they'll, they'll go along with the plan when it comes. Let's talk a little bit, uh, about some symptoms and, um, Commitment. Oh, I love this. Vague goals, wiggle room. Um, the the oh, you, you know, uh, I'm thinking back to one situation I observed, and and it's like, yeah, okay, is this the plan? Well, I guess so. I guess we can give it a try. You know, um, all sorts of all sorts of vague outcomes and lots of wiggle room, and let's give it a try. And well, maybe so. 
No, that that means the commitment is not there. You should really back up and give another run at it because people are giving themselves an out. And, and when people have an out, they might be the first ones that say, well, I never thought that was going to work anyway. Or I never was part of, you know, I, I just never really was on board with that new dare, that new mail, milking protocol or, or whatever the, whatever the situation was. So, um, yeah, you, you need to, you, when, when you're moving forward, you got to have people that, that, that believe and, and, and one of the best ways to do it is ask their opinion, make them part of the process. So. So Tim, this is where I want to ask this question. Yeah. And um, in my head, this one fits perfectly into this section. I apologize to the writer if this isn't quite what you were thinking, but um, the reason I was putting it here, and I don't want to put my words into their words, but um, I think sometimes this is where it happens within families, but their question reads exactly, my brother isn't pulling his weight and my parents don't call him out. How do we get equal time on the clock and share in the management of the farm, not just the pay? Ooh, really common, very frustrating, but, but really, but really common. And that, that does show a lack of commitment somewhere. Uh, that, that's, that, those, those are all great symptoms. My question is, is um, what's the root? What's the, what's the root of that? Um, we can look at all these symptoms, you know, not pulling the weight, clocking in late, not as many hours, letting stuff slide. Those are all symptoms. My, my, my first thought is sitting down and really understanding why, what is behind each one of those? Um, because until you understand the root cause of why people do what they do, it's really hard. It's really hard to to tackle a, a resolution in, in building that commitment. And I say that that sometimes, if people are disengaged like that, and they're owners, and they're the next generation, and things like that, um, maybe they don't like it. Maybe they don't want to disappoint mom and dad, and say, "I don't like dairy. I don't like farming." It's really hard. It's really hard to have that conversation when, when if, if, as an example, mom and dad have said, "I'm building this for you guys. We're doing all this for you guys, so you can farm someday." And you have a kid's like, "I don't like it. I don't want it. I don't want to work that hard. I, I, I want to go to my. It's more important for me to go to my kid's ball game." As an example, these are all these are all things that I'd say go back to what, especially within family. What what are their core values? Uh, what do what um, and figuring out what's important to them, because otherwise we're just we're just kind of going around the circle here and trying to trying to, you know, it's kind of playing whack-a-mole with, with all the with all these symptoms. OK, long and I, answer. I do apologize if that was too long of an answer. No, I think that's a good answer. And I actually want to ask you a little bit more on this on the first section or first sentence of this when it reads, my brother isn't pulling his weight and my parents don't call him out. Is it the parents responsibility in this situation? Or what would you suggest? Because I think it, it's it feels like at least from what I'm reading some tension there. Yes, yes. Um, ideally, parents would 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 call it out. But at a what what I and and I'm being a I'm being a little bit general here. Um, parents are also I, I think a lot of times it, it comes out of fear. If I call out my son, what will that do to the relationship with my son's wife? If I call him out and he decides to leave the farm, I'm afraid what his life will turn out like. I'm afraid what sorts of decisions he'll make. I'm afraid what it will do to our reputation. And so they don't call it out. And yet somebody has to. Somebody has to has to be brave and call it out. And and that I, I'm not suggesting that you have one big meeting and you blow it out and, and, and such like that. You need to start having consistent meetings and creating that issues list and setting expectations. And then if X, and then if people are waffling around, hey, I don't want to be accountable, then we have to figure out why. But ideally, it would be mom and dad. I'd say less than 50 percent of the time, mom and dad actually do it. it. It usually is a sibling or a cousin or somebody else. 
that that takes that 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 really steps in and takes a a leadership role on that. Yep. Well, thank you for addressing that. I know that's a hard question for somebody to type in and also to give, you know, feedback on with not being able to dive into it more specifically. Um, but thank you for that as we continue on. Yeah. So some of the cures for lack of commitment, set deadlines, right? So if you say, hey, we're going to do this, have a, have a deadline. Have a deadline when, when, when people are, you know, it, it's just like, hey, we're going to make it, we're going to make a decision in two weeks from now about whatever. Um, ask for ideas and input. Solicit other people's ideas and thoughts, even if you don't agree with them. Uh, that's okay. Um, like, once again, people are committed to the plan that they help build. And, and I, think, I think of a farm in uh, one of my clients in Ontario, Canada, and uh, shop was a mess. I mean, the shop was a mess. And he would go in there and he'd say, come on, guys, you know, this isn't how we do it. And, and uh, he had all these rules and all these specs and, and it still didn't get done. Finally, he just said, tell you what, he went to his employees and he says, you create the solution. You create the solution and come back to me with it. And uh, miraculously, the solution that they came up with was, uh, uh, you know, the owner didn't think that it was perfect, but you know what? The results were perfect because it was their idea. And instead of being told, they were given a choice in, in how to solve it. So, okay. all right. How are we doing on time? Yeah. We're doing good. We're doing good. Doing all right. Um, so once we built that commitment, we built that commitment to the outcome, right? That vision, that outcome. We, we've, uh, and it's not vague. It's, it's very precise. So, we, so we know what we're saying yes to, right? How, how, we have to be clear. Um, then, then we say, let's talk about accountability. And accountability is one of those words that gets thrown out all the time. Um, and it, I, I frankly don't have a perfect definition of it. Um, but I, I, I think to several instances where the accountability, the best accountability that I've ever worked with and observed is when the team is accountable to each other. So they're not waiting, right? So often what happens is the team is accountable to results when they get caught, right? So it's the boss's job or the manager's job is to walk around and to and to catch people at, at 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 something and and that's that's how they drive accountability from the top down the the best accountability is when the teammates look at at each other and say hey we're committed to quality milk we're committed to getting this cell count down right with that's what that's what we committed to and look what you're doing here you, you know, you're not following protocol and they don't wait for the boss to figure it out and look at the numbers and have it come down through. No, instead, they're dealing with it head on in the moment crossways. And and the best teams, boss may never know that there was an issue, but they're holding each other accountable to the standards that they've committed to. Um, and that's a that can be an uncomfortable place to be. And there are some people, there are some personalities that absolutely will not like that. And they may not have a place on your farm if they're not able to be accountable to each other. Right. We, we, that, that's one, that's one stickler. Uh, that's one area that I'm a kind of a stickler on is we got to have people that are self driven and self accountable and they don't wait to be caught. So, uh, but, but if there's not trust there, right? So if there's not trust, they're worried that they're going to jeopardize their personal relationships and, and, and such like that. So once again, it starts from the bottom and, and builds up. So I have a it's couple a questions here before we yep. move on, if that's okay. Yep. So Fire we're away. talking about accountability and, you know, you want to be accountable to each other or you have your employees accountable to each other, excuse me. Um mm -hmm. With that dynamic, does that ever create, and I know you kind of spoke on this, but does that ever create headbutting situations where either somebody can't take the accountability from somebody who is their peer or somebody is abusing the power of having the, um, trying to keep somebody or hold somebody accountable to what they think it is and maybe not align with the farm, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. So, so that's, that's back up a little bit when, when we start talking about commitment and, and, uh, and there's a reason why commitment comes first, Be right. because when there's a commitment to a standard, this is how we do things. Right. And, and it's clear and it's concise. And they've, they've said, yes, this is, this is what I will do. And then they don't do it. it it's not a, it, it's kind of a black and white thing. It's, there's not a lot, there, there shouldn't be a lot of wiggle room to say, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe not. It's, it, it's, um, it's kind of black and white. So be very, very um, specific when you're, when, when, what commitments you're looking for and what sort of standards and results. Um, but yeah, you can, um, you can butt heads. And I think that, I think that's okay. Uh, because what it will do is it will set, it'll set a, a standard for what you allow. On, on your dairy farm and uh, what you allow on your dairy farm, you will attract some people and you will repel others. And that's okay. We want to repel the people that do not want to be accountable. And we want to keep finding people that will be accountable. And, and the thing is, is that whenever we're looking at high functioning teams, they don't want slackers on their team. Right. So the beauty of this uh, beauty of this accountability is, is to, to set results is they're going to they're going to take care of their own issues. And and when it comes time, when there's an opening, they're going to tell their friends and their cousins and their brother to come work here because we're a high functioning team. And it, and they're going to be able to get rid of the ones that aren't. And it, doesn't that sound like a win-win? Um, yeah, there's a little bit of pain. Sure, we have to hire some more people. We have to find some more people and such like that. But that's 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 admitted. We get so much more from way less stress and everything like that when we have high-functioning teams. So, Well, um, and then kind of ahead. off of that, um, when we're talking about this and you know the accountability aspect of it, how do you get the buy-in? The buy-in from the right people on the team and making sure that, you know, you're not just implementing it and it's not just starting or whatever the case may be. And people are grumbling in the background and saying, I don't want to do this. And I think this goes along the lines of what we're talking about here. So how does that buy-in really, you know, work and fluidly happen within the team that you're building? So buy-in buy-in comes at all levels, right? So, so you got to have buy-in at the top, right? Because the last thing you want is one owner doing one thing and one owner doing another thing and, and, and different standards. But then, but then as, but then taking it to, Hey, we've got this idea. We want to try this. We think this is the direction that we need to go. Asking their opinion, asking their thoughts, and, and, uh, and sometimes it's a change in protocol. Those are fairly easy. Sometimes you're, you're asking them to do something that they genuinely don't want to do. Um, maybe you have to, during harvest, they've got to put in way more hours than, than what they want to. Uh, with that, then, you know, it's like, okay, that's come to a win-win here. Uh, let's talk about, so can we have, you know, if you're trying to get buy-in, understanding where they're coming from, even if you don't agree with it, uh, making sure that that you're that you're present when they do talk. And what I mean by present is um, when they when they talk, be able to articulate back what they just said. When they're talking, when you're in a meeting, please don't look at your cell phone. Right, pay attention, understand them as a person. Not necessarily that you always agree. But that you that you understanding where how they are looking at things, um, and you and it's unfortunately it takes time, and sometimes it takes multiple meetings and, and such like that. But okay. some people some people will not commit, and you might as well find that out, right? Um, might 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 as well might as well find that out. Uh, same same way with accountability, we we can't we can't force that. Um, we can, we can only make it as easy as possible. A um, couple of things on accountability. A any more questions? I'm, I'm sorry, Amber. Any any follow-up questions? or? No, all good. I appreciate that. Um, but no, I will let you continue on at this time. All right, perfect. 
Uh, avoidance of accountability. So the thing is, a lot of times, this is family members, right? Not committed. Maybe goes back to a previous question that, that we that we had, right? They're, yeah, they're just not committed, but they're not accountable, right? And, 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 and they're not, and a lot of times, like I said, this is family members. And um, I've got this, I, I'll pick a, I'm a, this imaginary person. I'll call her Aunt Flo. Aunt Flo has been here from the beginning, right? She She's a fixture in the office. Aunt Flo has her own way of doing things. And it's books and records. And Aunt Flo comes and goes as she pleases. Uh, she doesn't learn the new systems. Um, she she has been offered help before, but she runs them off. Right now, the interesting thing is, who's going to hold Aunt Flo accountable? Right, it, it's really really tough to do, but it ha it has to happen for the for the for the for the business sake and and really for the family's sake because sooner or later the business will sour the family. If if one isn't healthy, the other won't be healthy. Um, it's uh, we see it we see it with kind of some privileged attitudes that can creep in over time. Where it's like, hey, I'm the owner's son. I have a different, um, you know, I have a different set of rules that I follow. Um, and so it it becomes it becomes pretty tough to do. Um, but I think there's enough instances out there that um, that we know when we see it. So let's look at some of the cures. Um, it's really when, like I said, I covered this a little bit earlier. It's when the team holds themselves to high standards. So the standards might be set by the owners and the leaders, but the team holds themselves accountable to those standards. Um, and, it, and it often is, is, hey, how do we behave? What are our values? So going back to what are our core values and principles, how do we act based on that? Um, you know, for uh, let me give you an example. We're we're going to be accountable. Uh, we're honest with you, with each other at all times. We ask for help, and we give help to team members when when needed. We work hard, but also retain our sense of humor. We constantly learn and grow our knowledge and skills. That is from a farm that I worked with. That they came up with. This is how we behave. And and um. And, and it's a it's a great way to build accountability towards helping each other, uh, having fun. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can weave into it. And but it's setting setting the standard. Um, a great tip that this came from a farm in Illinois. That when we have accountability, this isn't just personal accountability, it's team accountability. So instead of getting this idea, well, I'm doing my job, I show up on time, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 it's now, it's we. And, and so it's team accountability. And so this one farm in Illinois, they had problems with employees being way too hard on equipment. Way, I mean, I mean the equipment expenses and repairs were, were off the charts. And so they had all these, you know, the, they, they created a stick, right? And they, they, and that didn't work. The stick approach didn't work. And instead they flipped and they said, okay, we're spending, and I forget how much money it was. It was tens upon tens of thousands of dollars. I think it was pro approaching $100,000 of unforced errors that this farm was having every year. And they said, tell you what, we have $50,000. This is your bonus. It's $50,000. When we find an unforced error, when people are screwing up equipment, backing into things, running into telephone poles with with the auger out on the combine, whatever it is, it's coming off of this $50,000. It's yours, but you can lose it. And so right there, man, people started that team. They came together and they started watching each other's behavior, calling each other out, helping each other, try not to screw up so that there wasn't uh, these unforced errors. And once again, the you know the the owner the boss the manager was no longer the bad cop that that had to go around and catch people so we're looking to have self self policing accountability i just have to say i really love the one farm you were talking about prior to the one here even though it's a great idea as well but how they mentioned that they wanted to keep the sense of humor 
in it as well. It did. It didn't feel rigid. It felt like these are the people behind it. This is who they are and what they want for their farm. So I just, I want to reiterate that I, I love that aspect of it because every, every person's different. Every farm is different and what they value all matters. And so I think that's something that's really great that they put in there. Yeah, it's, you know, yes, we're producing milk We're you know, all, all of these really important things, but we can't, do that. We can't meet peak efficiency if we don't pay attention to our cows. Like we all know that. We also can't have peak efficiency if we don't pay attention to the human side of our employees as well. And people love to be part of a winning team. I mean, if anybody's ever played any sports in high school or anything like that, winning is so much fun. Nobody likes to be on a losing team. So we need to create all of the aspects of a winning team um, because then it's fun. And when it's fun, people put in extra effort. They pay attention. They tell other, others how great it is to work there. And it might not be about the pay. It probably is about the pay. Um, so um, one thing on accountability, though, it's really tough with family. And so with family, we have to sterilize it a little bit. Um, there are several different, uh, I, I genuinely believe that if a family farm is going to work together, especially with multiple generations, there has to be some sort of feedback that comes around at least once a year, if not twice, where other people on the team, other owners, other employees, give feedback to that owner, to that manager, to the next generation. And uh, this is kind of tough to do, right? Because we're used to being the boss, the one that's in charge. We, we really don't, in some respects, don't want that feedback and don't really want to be held accountable, right? We, hey, we're the owners. We can come and go as we please. We can do what we want. All of those things are true. But when we become accountable as well, then really, really awesome things happen. And so there's all sorts of uh, 360 feedback programs and such like that. But um, it, it, it is tough to do with family, but it absolutely, I'm a, I'm a huge believer and I, I, I've just seen it work so many times. Here we go. Results. So we built everything up. We've, we've built that trust, be able to conflict. With conflict, we can solve the problems. We can build that commitment around where we're going, how we're going to get there. We can hold ourselves accountable along the way. Finally, it's results. And, and this is sometimes thought of, well, each person has their results. And that's true. But this is really about team results. And, and when you position this with your team, it needs to be not one person's area of expertise and they get rewarded. They sink or swim together. Uh, the, the, the Navy SEALs, as an example, uh, are all about teamwork. They, they do not put out the highest, um, the most skilled people in their teams. They put out the people that can work the best in the teams. And they are a huge believer that people succeed and fail as a unit. And that's really what this is about. It's about team results. Um, let me tell you a story about Cowboy Bob. Cowboy Bob is a real person that I've run across many times, and, I, and you guys have probably too. Cowboy Bob was probably the first employee on the farm. Highly skilled, knew what to do, was in a mind-brain lock with the owner, with the original owner, and there was no team, right? It was just Bob, and Bob did it all, and Bob would show up just he, he was just consistent. He didn't sleep, really. He just showed up. He worked. He was fussy. He did everything great. But over time, other employees came along, right? The, the, the farm grew, the dairy expanded, whatever. Mo Bob, he's still Bob. He's got all of his own traits, and they're not team traits. They're not driven towards results. Bob is himself, and he's only worried about Bob. He doesn't believe anyone can do the job as good as he is. And he's not going to train him because he doesn't really like to be around people that well. 
Um, nobody wants to work with Bob and he doesn't want to work with everybody. And so now the farm is stuck with what do we do with Bob, right? We can't, we can't put him on the harvest crew because there's too many, you know, too, too many people working together and this and that. And so what do you do with Bob? And it takes, you cannot create a team with Bob's. You can't have cowboys off doing their own thing. You have to be able to work together. Um, otherwise, what happens is you end up with a dog eat dog organization that isn't focused on team results. They're focused on their own results. And, uh, and, and that doesn't work long term. Um, and what are some of the some of the uh, some of the symptoms, right? It's important we talk about the symptoms. Um, turf wars, people people trying to argue about their area needs more people or resources. Maybe growth stagnates because decisions aren't being made. People say, "Well, that's not my problem. Our area here, we're doing great." You know, don't don't. It's not. Uh, don't talk to me about that. Um, and, and and probably. Um, Probably the one that I that I that I also hear that's maybe a little more subtle is well we're trying hard, right? Well, well we're all trying hard, and that's good. Trying hard is good, but yet at the end of the day, there's certain metrics, there's certain results that as a team you got to hit, and uh, and that's why trying hard uh, you know needs to be shifted just a, just a little bit because that's that's really not showing that commitment as well. Um, so some of the cure team goals, right? Instead of having individual production goals or metrics or things like that, they win and lose as a team. And, um, and, and also when they're doing that, just think about a team and the results, there's always something up there called a scoreboard. The scoreboard lets you know what's happening, what's happened. Dairy is fantastic. So much better than other areas of ag because there's lots of data and you guys do a fantastic job of capturing it. But, but it needs to leave, that data needs to leave your office. It needs to get out there in front of the people that can actually make the change so that they can affect the score in real time. And, and in a lot of dairies, this is not a problem at all. This, this is actually working extremely well. Um, and uh, yeah, and then finally, you know, put, put the team uh, in control of their rewards. And, and when you do that, you can really get uh, the results that, that you're looking for. So Tim, along this line of results, we had a question come in. Mm -hmm. and this one's about Cowboy Bob again. And it reads, uh, okay. so how do you get Cowboy Bobs to work together? I br bring them in, bring them into the process bring them into um you know that they, they don't let bob go off and, and be busy he needs to be part of the meeting and when he sits in the corner maybe and doesn't participate you need to ask his 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 opinion you need to draw him out a lot of, a lot of the cowboy bob types are very quiet um and uh, and stuff so you need to need to draw him in uh, make him, you know, maybe fluff his ego a little bit, ask his opinion and such like that. But really then in those meetings, you're setting, you're setting the stage for our culture is going to change. And, and our culture is about collaboration. It's about team results. It's, it's, you start building that in. I would say, you know, often the Cowboy Bobs will come along. They may not be a star player, but they'll come along. Uh, in some cases, maybe 20% of the time, Bobs just don't fit. And after a while, if you can't find enough stuff for the Bobs to go off and do by themselves, they're kind of done. Um, either they retire, uh, which is which which is fine, or or they just go and work someplace else. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Because I know everybody, like you said, knows a Bob or, or has one in their life. And they're just like, well, what do we do? So thank you. But just understand, you cannot build a team with Bobs. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just, uh, they're good people, right? They're good people and, and they're good people for some farms. But maybe your dairy farm is just outgrowing Bob. And, and that's okay. That's perfectly okay. So roughly, oh, we're getting right up here on time. So roughly 
85% of team success is, is traced back to how well they can manage these five attributes. And, and there's been a number of studies to validate that. Um, even with imperfect people, even with imperfect leaders, even with family dynamics, really being intentional about each one of these five steps, you can influence a lot. You know, there's many things we can't in that, that we don't have any control about the weather, the markets, et cetera. This is something that you absolutely can influence and change. And it will allow you to scale up because you're going to be able to delegate and get things off your plate to a high functioning team. Um, you know, decrease your distractions because when you're not distracted by the drama that your people are bringing to the table, now you can focus on that next new thing. And, and like we said, we're having fun, right? Winning teams are a lot of fun to have, and it's going to make finding employees so much easier as well. And, and efficiency goes up and guess what? You do end up making more money uh, along the way as well. So that's the, that's the five functions of all great teams. Well, thank you for that, Tim. Um, going off of that, you know, as we're wrapping up here today, what's that one or two key points that you really want to drive home with today's listeners? Sure. Teams are built, great teams are built over time. They don't just happen. E even if you look across the fence and you see your neighbor and man, it just looks like, looks like just magic over there. And, and maybe you're a little bit discouraged about what you have going on in your own situation they that just didn't happen right that was an that was an intentional process that they that they've gone through and it takes time um so don't get discouraged because this is this is possible uh to build to build a great team but it does take time and and they are built and and it takes uh intention as well so okay I also had a question and I'm going to have this be our last question for today. And I think it's a great sure. wrap up one and it reads sure. what books or podcasts would you recommend to a farmer and or their employees to provide continuing education in this area? Ooh. Um, so for one, PDPW puts out fantastic amounts of, uh, of material. And, and if you're not attending, uh, if you're not attending various conferences and such, absolutely start there. Um, podcasts. Hmm. That come off the top of my head. Let me grab my phone. I've, I've got way too many podcasts. You know what? My phone is not with me. Um, there's one out there called coaching for leaders. It's a, it's a little as it's a little deep. Uh, it can get a little wonky, but there's some good things in there about coaching for leaders. Uh, and it literally is the coaching for leaders podcast. That's what it's called. So it okay. has nothing to do with dairy, <laughs> by the way. So, so this is broad based business. Well, and I think that's okay because every, it's sometimes really good to get outside of what we know and what we're, we're digesting on the daily to, to get some outside perspective. And that's always helpful. Just the same. Um, if there's anything else Tim, that you could, you think of always feel free to shoot it our way and we can project that out to, to more of our, our members as well. Um, but is there any last comments you want to give before we, we wrap up here this afternoon? Oh, there is, there is one, there is one more. It's called call to coach by Gallup. Gallup puts it out. It's called call to coach. And, um, that one's really good as well. There, there, there's some good, good stuff in there. Um, okay. you know what? I think, I think we've covered, uh, we've covered a lot of um, I guess if somebody wants to know more, um, we always open this up for PDPW members. Uh, they, they can just, uh, they just go to our website, encore-consultants.net, and, and just schedule a 20-minute call. And if you want to bounce an idea off us, great. There's no charge for that. If you'd like to really see where your family or your team is with the five functions of a team, kind of as a, hey, where do we start? Are we, are we high? Are we low? Uh, if you scan the QR code here on the screen, what it, it's going to take you to where you can download our assessment and uh, and take it from there. So, well, thank you, Tim, for all of your information and insight here today and the resources as well. Um, I know it's always a pleasure to have you on, especially as we you know think about our families, our businesses, and all that that entails. So, thank you so much for your time here this afternoon. 
You bet. I always enjoy this. And it, it's just, uh, I just really appreciate uh, how much effort you guys put, put into uh, into these podcasts because it's, it, it's a real, it's a real joy. And there, there's a lot of good stuff that comes from it. So. Well, well, thank you for that. Um, and I also do want to say, aside from thanking Tim for being here today, thank you to all of our partners of PDPW who make programs like the Dairy Signal possible. Make sure to check them out over on our website. Also, make sure to check out what's coming up next in the world of PDPW. We've got some great programs coming up this fall, including um, coming up here in this month is our Stride Youth Leadership Conference. So we're mixing together some leadership, some agricultural career development, hands-on land Labs, all of that good stuff coming up here on Saturday, September 23rd for youth ages 15 through 18. And that'll be actually at the UW-Madison campus. So really exciting place to be able to hold that this, this year. Uh, also coming up in October, we've got our herds person, our calf care connection workshops, and so much more. Uh, so make sure to keep an eye out. Make sure to check those out as well. And for now, we'll see you here tomorrow, though, on the Dairy Signal. Bye now.